Réunion est maintenant enregistrée. Meeting recording has started. OK. Uh, uh, that's nice. Uh, so, my thinking is about whether how this whole process change of, of the Hungarian political sphere and the economic happens and how, how we can understand the situation in our region. I put it there, varieties of capitalism in Central Eastern Europe, but we can talk actually varieties of political capitalism True. in Central Eastern Europe. And I'm telling you a little bit about the theoretical background of this. Of course, when we are talking about varieties of capitalism, then in 2001, there was a seminar work of Hall and Soskis about varieties of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We cannot use, to be honest, for the region. Mm -hmm. If you remember, I don't know whether you, you, you read the book, they are focusing on enterprises, enterprises and looking at innovation. Mm -hmm. Innovation, how the United States or Germany innovate liberal market economies and coordinated market economies. The whole idea is that we need some specific comparative advantage to understand economic systems. Uh, and they said that different institution brings different comparative advantage. The US, the liberal market economy is radical innovation. The other is, 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 is incremental innovation in production. Mm -hmm. They are fully right. The main problem in our region, mm -hmm. and maybe the region, some of you are coming, yes. but without understanding the state uh, as a main actor, you cannot understand the whole game. Mm -hmm. So that's why we cannot use the theoretical framework. Mm -hmm. Those authors, we, uh, I put it in the slides, are focusing on Central and Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And all of them are going to the same direction. The most famous work is Nölke works, mm -hmm. who wrote that these countries are dependent market economies. Dependent market economies means that they, are, they are, do not have enough uh, capital uh, and they are re relying on forex direct investment from Western Europe. Mm -hmm. And that's a hierarchic uh, uh, relation between Western European headquarters and uh, 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 local, local companies. Mm -hmm. But still, it's all, again problematic because it's talking not about the state. Uh, Beata Farkas, the first author, I put it on the slide. Uh, he he talked that. But what is really the most important feature of the region is lack of capital. We do not have capital because maybe of the communist uh, era. So it's uh, lack of capital, which is something economic weak. Civil society is polit It's already political things, weak society will mean strong state mm -hmm. uh, and the influence of European Union. So somebody from outside telling us uh, what to do. Uh, to be honest, I, I usually use the fourth one, Dorothy uh, Bule uh, and Bela Greshkovich book. The, the whole idea, I don't want to go to in detail that they use both the they analyze both the uh, analytic uh, the political system and the economic system and try to build up a typology uh, by which we can uh, typify uh, specific economic systems political economic systems so how we can typify that we need some kind of comparative advantage against the others and what is the, the main advantages for us is that we can produce. Produce, that means we are not innovating. That's the idea of NERCA. So uh, if you remember, United States is innovating, radical innovation, Western Europe mm. is uh, incremental innovation. We have an, a comparative advantage to produce without innovation <laughs> because innovation is happening in the headquarter, but we are skilled workers uh, who can assemble products like Mercedes-Benz, Audi, these kind of things. And if you look at the Hungarian economic policy nowadays in Hungary, under Fidesz, actually we are following this. We are producing Mercedes, Audis, Opels, now 
battery industry is arriving to us, but no innovation at all. Uh, uh, it's coming from abroad. If you can go further, uh, the, the, it's a little bit slow. To understand the whole thing, it's, it's, we go to dig deeper and understand the institutions. But behind economic and political system, there are always institutions which we should understand. All the authors are focusing on that. And I would like to show you the idea of Peter Böttke and Peter Liesen, we just talked about. It's, the idea is from not from me, but from them, that institution somehow sticks to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, even Cole and Sotsky talk about institutional complementarities, that, that we need institutions should fit together. They also said that the whole problem that I find and what is my added value, at least for me, that, that I think we need to look at political institution and economic institution together. Mm -hmm. And these institutions put in, in our region is not a fix, something homogeneous, something. I will tell you later, but so the core, uh, which, which actually Wirt Kandizen said is the Mathis, or informal institutions, which is the most stickiest to our culture, mindset, tradition, habits, is, is something homogeneous. So we can grab the French uh, informal institutions and, and we can understand them. And to be honest, uh, it's most of the scholar thinking that. Uh, one of my favorite is Cheng Gang Shu from, from China. He wrote a book, the Institutional Genes of China, and he tried to uh, uh, understand the institutions of, of China. Uh, but in our region, I think it's not so easy to capture the Hungarians or the Polish uh, institutions, and I will tell you why. So the whole idea, what I would like to tell you, uh, that I agree with Peter Brodsky and Lisen that the stickiest one is, and we have to grab the, the informal institutions, norm, tradition, habits. The blue one uh, is, is the insti formal institution, written institution, uh, uh, legal aspects, constitution, but actually accepted by the government. So, and the government, the, our own people, Orban, Viktor, uh, Kaczynski, Mechia, mm -hmm. Babish, mm -hmm. they are all populist in Central Eastern Europe, is ourselves. So they understand the society. So it's all still very sticky, the ideas, what it's coming to us. The, the yellow one is the European Union. <laughs> Foreign institutional, formal institutions, regulations, hard law of the European Union. Uh, intervention of the IMF. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not so sticky, but still sticky. Uh, I don't know, for instance, Hungary was part of the Ottoman empires for 150 years. The Ottoman empires also intervene into the Hungarian regulations and push this yellow institutional layer to their other institutions. Uh, if we hold it for a long time, it do have a very strong effect. Think about Central Asia and the Russian Empire. They were there for mm -hmm. hundreds of years, uh, and it's, 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 it's have a very strong impact. So if we go further, slowly, then you can, it's, it's not important, we can skip it. I already told. Then this is the, the I institutional idea, what I, I use to understand how economic system, political capitalism emerging in our region. Mm -hmm. And you have to look at the history of this region, look at institutions and change. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is coming from Korna Janos idea fully, system paradigm. I think this is the best uh, approach to look at uh, why we are living such a world as we are living. And for that, sorry, I'm an old-fashioned teacher. I'm always good to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to the, to the uh, board. I don't know why. 
but you have to look at informal institutions mm -hmm. and their Douglas Moore class dependence is very important historical. So you have to, if you look interested in Iran, then you have to understand the whole history of Iran. Without just looking now, it's not helpful. Mm -hmm. And you have to look at the formal institutions. But for that, don't forget it's, it's always the elite who is making the formal institutions. And that's 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 something uh, here I'll become that depressing because the elite are actually using uh, such uh, formal institution, laws, regulation, which actually supporting them to have the power, have the power. Because that, 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 that's why I think Qualcomm and elite theory is, is very useful to analyze this one. And the last one, which, which is the same importance, is those international organizations which, uh, and superpowers which do have an effect on smaller countries like Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and this is the credit every idea. Credit every This is Mirage, French military, military, I just saw in my window. Okay, <laughs> fine. Uh, so, this the gravity theory means that smaller, like, like the sun is, I don't know, the, the European Union, and smaller countries are going around of it and learn from that. Or, or Russia, it's, it's a sun, if I can say that. I'm not sure, but so you, you can understand. So are gravitating and, and getting institutions from, from them. Yeah, it's, it's, you have to push the button. I said you have to push the button on there, but it's not helpful. We can go further. So let's see the history of the region. Very bloody history of Central and Eastern Europe, I'm sure you know. So that's really in the border of the West and, and the East part of, of the world. Mm -hmm. The East is also Europe. So Russia is European in this sense. I don't say that it's, mm -hmm. it's not part of us. But the value system, which is the core of this onion I, I showed you, the value system is quite different from Germany and, and, and Russia. But we in Central Eastern Europe, living in a world in the last couple of hundred years, thousands of years, where sometimes Germans arrived and, and we were part of Austrian Hungary for hundreds of years. Then we were part of the Ottoman Empire. So looking at the maps, it will be very helpful. The previous ha map, you don't need to go back. The previous map showed Russia. As you can see, they were, you, you know that Poland was part of Russia, half of Poland was half of Russia. Some part of Ukraine was part of it. Uh, but if we look at the other maps, Ottoman Empire, Czech Republic was never part of the Ottoman Empire. Poland was never part of the Ottoman, the, but the Balkan or Hungary mm -hmm. was part of it quite a long time. And then, of course, we were part of the Austrian Empire, which is bringing the value system of the West. Mm -hmm. So we have to always live with and adapt our values, uh, institutions to these superpowers. That's why how small countries in the region can live and exist. And that's why actually sovereignty and nationalism is so important for these countries because we are very proud that we, after 1,000 years of struggle with these superpowers, we still there. Uh, and and that's, that's, that's one of the key mindset of these countries. One of my PhD students put it together, this uh, uh, data set. It's just showing how many years one of the countries in the region was under Russian, uh, influence Chinese, Mongol Empire, Austrian, Prussia, Germany, Ottoman Empire. And, and from that, we can learn something. As you can see, Hungary was part of the, for instance, we were not part of the uh, uh, Chinese, but we were part some years for Russia. The influence was much stronger. That's it. It's only 44 years, it says, because of the Soviet Union, but it's actually the influence was much stronger. Uh, during our history, and and of course the longest time we were in under the Austrian Habsburg monarchy. Mm -hmm. If we go further, so to understand 
the situation what we have now in Hungary, you have to look at the value system. And we have a very heterogeneous value system in Hungary, which means we fully understand liberal values, but we fully understand illiberal values. And there is a clash inside our core value system. And some part of the Hungarian soul and part of the Hungarian nation supported strongly the, the Western values, enlightenment and liberal, liberal values. But another part, we have many names in Hungarian of these two. Eastern values is, is not accepting that and they, they supporting Eastern part of the values. Uh, after the transition, and some of my colleagues who are here were part of, of, of the transition, I mean, uh, parting as a hero, uh, uh, they, they, of course, after the, the communist dictatorship, the society thought, of course, we should join the Western values. So the mass is also supporting them, and the elite was also supporting to take Western values and turn Hungary to a liberal democracy. So after the transition, we became liberal democracy, but it was a fragile liberal democracy because of the value system uh, of the Hungarians. Uh, and if it's true, and we can discuss it later, and I'm sure that my colleagues will add to that, that, it's, it, that all our system is fragile in Hungary, which means you ask me whether it's a very stable system of Orban. It's a stable system, I will tell you. In my presentation, I'm not, I don't know, but I suppose it's a stable system. But we can be sure that the Western values once turn back because it's also fluctuating in Hungary. Sometimes we are following one or the other. And th this, this is like, uh, uh, small atom that's in English also where, where there is powers against each other and the question is who, who is winning. Uh, why we have Orban? That's also an interesting question. And if you turn to the next slide, I have a hypothesis for that. And of course, this is the main key, key idea is the values, but of course, the change is crucial, the change from liberal democracy to illiberal. And I suppose we need two types of shocks for that, one for external shocks and one internal. The, the external shock was the financial crisis, which hit Hungary very hardly and badly for the mass. Uh, actually, huge part of the Hungarian society take loans in Euro and Swiss francs, and because of the financial crisis, it was, they were not able to pay it back. Uh, so th that was quite disastrous for the Hungarian economy and the nation. Uh, I will show you data to the next slide. But also we had an internal shock that at that time in the social government, we the second time the election in 2006, and there was a speech of Prime Minister Gyurcsány, the famous speech of lying. He talked, it was a not open speech, but for the members of the, the fraction, socialist faction, and he said that we lied to the nation. It's not true, but, and actually he didn't want to tell that, so it was a positive message. He wanted to say that now, from now on, we have to solve the problems. But of course, in a democracy, you cannot lie. So there was huge demonstration and shock for the society that the prime minister openly said that we are lying. The main problem that he stick to the power, I think it was a mistake of, of Ferenc Zsuzsa. So we have two crises and the other need for a change to make the Eastern value stronger than the, 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 the West is a guy who can grab the opportunity and understand the situation that from now on I can take it. And that's Orban Viktor. Who can who, who understand that now we can take the power? Uh, he lost one election previously because in 98 to 2002 he was prime minister and he lost, and it was a really shock for him. So he understands that he wouldn't like to lose anymore. 
<laughs> and the idea is how can I, as Janusz Kornai wrote, how can we make a power such a way that we never lose again? Hold power forever. And that's why we have policies to 30 and 40, 2040 nowadays in Hungary, because or by thinking that there will be no governmental change for the next couple of years, decades. So if we look at the varieties of political capitalism, I think it's quite clear how we can change from communist dictatorship to capitalism. Janos Kornai give us exactly, well, I, I accept what he wrote to, to uh, what steps we needed for that. But after that, the question is how the political system is. So the political, without understanding the political system, you cannot understand the economic system. Uh, I suppose, uh, because the, the political system will make understandable how the economic institution, ownership, and coordination mechanism is working. And uh, I learned from your book, uh, 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 Destructive Power, that, that how, how destructive coordination is used. And I think non-democratic capitalist system is using more both of them are using both, of course, but it's, it's much stronger in the non-democratic uh, systems. Destructive power, rent-seeking, um, predation on, on, on wealth. Uh, and I give you, can give you many examples of, of, of that. Maybe not as much as in Iran, but almost. And creative coordination, innovation is, is the key for for democratic capitalism, and we have, of course, sub subtypes in each system. Okay, let's go further. So, as I said, political systems, I think it's crucial to understand economic systems. And uh, I made for, I wrote a paper in the last weeks on uh, how the higher education system in Hungary changed because of illiberalism, and I took this from, from that paper. Uh, as you can see, the world is changing such a way that systems are converging to, to be illiberal and, and not non-democratic. Democracy in these uh, slides means procedural democracy, mm -hmm. elections. If you look at all, all the countries, we have elections. It's nothing to mean with democracy for me. So the election, election is not helpful because you can, you can have election in Uzbekistan and 72% of the people are supporting the, the dictator. Uh, in Turkmenistan, 92. Uh, so, so election is not, not helpful. That not helps. Liberalism is illiberalism. That, that's, that I think that's a very important point to understand. And slowly, many countries became in, in the last couple of decades or the last decades, they are going at that way. I don't say that liberal democracy like France are not moving that, that direction as well. We just talked about that during the lunch. Uh, I can imagine that all the countries are moving that way and we have big trouble mm -hmm. uh, in, in this sense, but uh, the, in, in the Specialist, you, 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 you were editor. I, I, I had the chance to have an empirical analysis of the Italian students and the Hungarians. Italian, I think, still put them in the liberal democracies, Italy. And it was a questionnaire I sent to students, 500 students from Italian students and Hungarian students, and compared whether the liberal values are protected values or not. Protected values, the, those values, which I can offer you some money and you won't say that you lose it. The, the, I give you some, for example, kids. So killing children is not allowed to any society in the world because kids are protected values. Killing kids is, is not, not allowed. Environmental issues in many cases nowadays there is a new generation for them. Saving the world is, 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 is a protected values. My question was to these students, liberal values are protected or not? And the 
the portion in Italy, and it was in University Trento at Corvinus Civitas' students, so it's not representative, but these students, but it's hundreds of students, there was a significant difference between the two. The, the, the portion who said that I, I fully like dictatorship, it was the same in Hungary and in, in, in Italy. So it's not a big difference. The difference was whether how much you think it's protected. And in Italy, it was significantly stronger that the students thought the Hungarian was in the middle. You know, if it's, we can make the deal and I let you kick out the migrants or, or take away the private property or these kind of things. But the Italian not, they stick to, 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 the, to the liberal values. So that's why I think even though in, in Italy there was full-fledged populist government, Liga Nord and uh, Five Star, they, are not, they cannot turn the system into, into uh, uh, illiberal. Uh, and that, that's critical. Uh, with that, I also agree with Wintrobe. It's a Canadian political scientist, also wrote many articles in, in, in uh, Public Choice, that, that the values are the most critical because in, in for, uh, formal institution, check and balances, it's not enough. In Hungary, in the last 25 years, we had Constitutional Court, Ombudsman, uh, all the stuff which is in Sweden and Norway and everything was there and ran more or less smoothly. After 2010, in five years, Orban could destroy everything uh, and, and change the formal institution, even though we have Constitutional Court now. It's uh, Fidesz members there, we have Ombudsman, Fidesz member. So we have, we have everything looks like that uh, working properly as a liberal, but it's not. If you go further, slowly, then I will show you the main characteristic of illiberal regimes. Again, uh, we can have a debate on, on that. Uh, the articles mostly written by Hungarians because these articles showing you examples mm -hmm. of, of how opportunism is actually happening in Hungary. Okay, the first one is, is, is actually Schlepp, but, but she is, she is focusing on Hungary. She's an American uh, professor in Yale, but most of them are Hungarians. Of course, Guriev and Treisman mm -hmm. is, is it's a theoretical book. Mm -hmm. uh, on mass manipulation and anti intellectualism, uh, okay. spin doctors. Yeah. Uh, I find they looks very important True. contribution to understand the situation mm -hmm. nowadays in Russia, in Hungary, and these illiberal states. Mm -hmm. uh, very quickly, I don't know how much time I have. You have uh, exactly 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Then yes. very quickly we can go through on. on. So opportunity is, 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 of course, they are interconnected, these, these features. Mm -hmm. uh, opportunity is, means that, that uh, the leader, and it's usually one leader who should be focusing on. So in Hungary, if you would ask the people who is the minister of something, nobody will know, even they don't know how many ministers we have. Because we have to listen only one guy, Viktor Orban. Uh, and everything is actually helping his power. And opportunism in, in this sense means that when we are looking at the public policies in specific areas, it's ideology is not important. It's not no ideology at all. So it's not leftish or right, as we just talked during uh, our cafe. Because it depends on how the majority can support this, this guy. Very interesting. Of course, intellectuals like you, maybe you'd say that you are not following him if it's against your values, but you are not important players, to be honest, in an illiberal regime, because it's anti intellectual. So it's not important. We can talk a lot with Vaslo Chabor, Peter Mihai, nobody cares what we are talking. 
and they know that. Political governance, political governance means that politics is above of everything. So economic policy should support the political will. The political system uh, and the political governance of, of the country is the key to, to hold the power. And this is, of course, both features are supporting populism. It's part of the populist idea. Populism, in a sense, means that uh, Orban and these regimes always try to find uh, dividends in the society, and it's not left and right. Something which you can tear apart and make problems, and they immediately try to, to act in their migration cries. So all, all these uh, stuffs, uh, uh, the best I think nowadays is, is, is connected to, to the intellectual. So that's why I look at the, the higher education system and public education system in, in liberal regimes, but not only there, as the most important battlefield uh, to, to, to win, win the, the, the battle forever for them. Okay, uh, search for enemies. We have plenty of enemies. The main things that the majority should also hate them. Roma people in Hungary, Jews, migrants, uh, LMBTQ people, uh, Shor George Soros, actually, billionaire and Jew, the best. Uh, so so we, we, uh, Brussels as a technocratic intervention into the sovereignty of the society. Sovereignty is a key factor. You, you wrote many things about that in, in your book. It's also true for Hungary. Sovereignty is, is, is we have to save our sovereignty against somebody else. And it's also connected to, to nationalism, to be proud uh, on that. And how we do that? We also talked about that restriction on freedom of press. It's 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 again. It was it was one of the first step in Hungary, which happened, and very systematically, they pushed back. It's nothing is disappearing. Don't think that there is no opposition press in Hungary. There is in Budapest. Mm. So Peter Mihai will talk a lot. He usually goes to the club radio which is on the internet because Orban is closed uh, only to, it can run only to, to the internet and he can talk whatever he would like to talk. And I can name you some newspapers where intellectuals are reading nobody else, 20,000 people. Uh, that of course you can do that. Uh, it's not, not a problem for them, but rural area, all the newspapers are in the hand of Orban and all the newspapers always giving the same ideas, manipulating. And this is true for the TV channels, which can be looked at, the, the state-owned TV channel, uh, which is connected us to the mass manipulation. So the whole idea to manipulate the mass, intellectuals are not important. Previously, in two years ago, if you ask me, I would say that they will fail because they forgot the intellectuals, that we are so strong and so influential that if we are talking, I can name many in the Hungarian intellectuals, everybody are listening to them, they will lose. I was stupid. Nobody cares about Chikan until uh, a very famous Hungarian scholar uh, telling, nobody cares because the whole idea is cut the intellectuals from the society, the majority in the rural part. They don't hear don't hear us at the moment. Uh, populism is also connected to cultural war. We have a huge uh, intervention in our culture to be nationalistic, illiberal, and we openly are illiberal. That's very important. I'm not sure that you know that Orban said that we are building a Christian illiberal state. So that's, that's, that's the program that we have. Uh, Welfare chauvinism is actually means that we provide welfare to specific Hungarian groups to the majority. I give you example. We are supporting the families, but only not 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 Roma families. So we have 
we know how these people are living and, and not, they are actually the poorest part of the families should not receive it. The best is to tax reduction. Those who are not paying tax because they have no work, they cannot get the tax reduction. That's immediately cut a huge part of the society, which the majority don't, don't really like. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Uh, we, I'm, 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 I'm slowly finishing. Yeah. So, but th this is one of the slides when you can understand that the system is systematically put together. So it's, it's, it's planned. Many scholars in Hungary said that it's not planned and there is no such thing that's planning. But I, after living in the last 13 years in Hungary, I have the feeling that there is planning and these uh, strong men, let's call them such a way because they are not dictator in such sense, learn from each other. Some of them turning to dictator. Putin is already a dictator. Erdogan, I think it's already a dictator. Uh, Orban is not a dictator in this sense because I'm not in prison. Janos Gornai told me that take your time, you will. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure that he was right in this sense. Uh, he was quite pessimistic at the end that this system will slowly deteriorating and going to the illiberal dictatorship, if you remember that slide. Let's go further. I already mentioned many aspects of, of changing the system. I just wanted to show some examples of, of changing the, 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 the way how it works. Political, I didn't mention economics and, and the economy of Hungary. It's, it's also changed. Uh, Peter can even talk more because he wrote many articles about that. And if I remember well, he, he would say that the ownership is, did not change a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, even though Orban tried to do that. But if the perception is important, and I do think that perception is important if we are talking about social sciences, so but the mindset thinking, uh, we can see that actually the ownership changed a lot. I can give you an example. My wife is working for a uh, consulting firm and they got a uh, so OECD asked them to make a list of the Hungarian owned companies, 100 biggest Hungarian owned companies, small and medium price enterprises uh, with, with which OECD can cooperate. Almost all of them somehow is connected to, to, the, to Fidesz. Mm -hmm. We can say that it's a very small part of the Hungarian economy because the biggest GDP producer is a multinational company, German, French, American multinational companies. But these, these, these companies are employing the Hungarians, not the multinationals. And people are connected, those companies which are run by the system. And if you are employee of such a specific company, there is a vertical connection to the system. So it's not easy to change anymore. So political capitalism, rent seeking, very typical. We have a new super bank in Hungary owned by the Mészáros Lőrinc, best friend of Viktor Orban. And I think one of the key problem, and we don't talk a lot about that, that who is really many rich person in one family is the Orban family, the father, the sister, so it's, it's in, in, in a European country, member of the European Union, the prime minister's family getting billionaire from state uh, procu procu uh, procurements, that's, that's definitely something very problematic. Mm -hmm. So if Macron family would be rich because of the French government giving them money, I hope the French people would go to the street and say that's not fair. Uh, we are not going to the street. We are accepting that, that it's, it's happening. Um, and we have plenty of other examples I can give you of that. Can you turn the slides? I think I have one more. No, go, go, go further. Uh, he, yes, you, you just, this, this one. 
So I, I try to give you some uh, uh, examples of, of foreign policy. We talked about West and East. Of course, we always vote and part of the European Union and NATO. But if you look at the discourse, the perception of the people, Viktor Orban meets with Central Asian leaders every month and move to Uzbekistan. And our foreign minister is frequently flying to Russia, China. So it looks like that we are actually part of that group, Eastern, Eastern groups, and not the West. Even though we know that at the end, Orban is always voting together with, with the Western. But it's, 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 he knows that this course is very important. Uh, the others I already mentioned. So slowly I will arrive to, to my end of my talk, but I have still have one slide, if I remember well. Yes, is the system stable? There is a book Chaba Laszlo wrote also a chapter on that, Handbook of Illiberalism. Mm -hmm. And one of the chapter, I don't remember which, said that it's a sta it's became stable if three elections, the populist leader can win the election, then we can say it's stable. I don't know why we can use this definition, but if we apply that, this is the fifth, the fourth for Orban and the fifth Orban government at all. So I would say that, yes, that's, that's already a, a, so think about that, that the kids born in 2010 or, or, or a bit earlier, only see Orban governments and illiberalism and learn from such books, which was written by uh, the Ministry of Education run by such guys who are modifying our history to be superheroes and, and others are bad. So it's, it's, it's changing uh, the way of thinking and, and the new voters are only seeing that. To be honest, if we look at the data sets, young people do not like Orban in Hungary, <laughs> because they, I, I think they are fed up with this guy. Uh, uh, and then and, and the Hungarian society support the European Union very strongly. 80% of the people would like to stay in the European Union. So if Orban would say that he would leave the European Union, that would be very problematic. He would never say that. So what we will need, uh, by, by the system is stable, the first one is the Eastern value system, but we have the European Union, because the European Union is financing this guy, Orban Victor, with the structural fund. Uh, also the European Union, because if I don't like living in Hungary, I can move to Paris and ask a job here in Paris North or in another university, so intellectual can flow out from Hungary. Uh, that's uh, Daniel Kellerman wrote an article about that. Uh, and also, to be honest, Western populist parties supporting Orban in foreign policy. That's also problematic. But Bozoki said, uh, actually, the European Union also constrained Hungary to become Erdogan a dictatorship. You won't be a dict living in a dictatorship because inside the European Union, you cannot become a dictator. You can be an illiberal state, but not a dictator, and I agree with that. So what we need for the change, and I, will, I think we will have, crisis, internal crisis, some kind of external crisis, and somebody from the opposition who, who we think he can offer us an alternative option. At the moment, we do not have that because the opposition is, is extremely weak, but the possibility is still there because the Western values are there uh, in our society. So we are sometimes there, sometimes it's a mixture of, of, of values, how I see Hungary. And the last slide. Two because, minutes. Well, it's, it's, it's just, I think the it's, thank so you, yes. the, 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 the some papers, I, 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 not all of them, I, I put it on the slide, but some of them, and the last one is the thank you, if I remember. <laughs> thank you very much for this stimulating uh, discussion. Uh, I am now turning to Peter Mihaly to uh, be as your discussant.
to review your work, uh, of course, critically. And uh, Peter, thank you very much for accepting to be a reviewer. And you will be having 15 minutes to give your report on this work. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the kind words. Uh, I think we can all congratulate to Miklos for this very rich, informative, all encompassing lecture. Uh, within the time limit I have, I will speak only uh, around two issues. There were several issues, but I can pick up two. And I hope that those two issues are important also for the logic of Mikrosh, and this is why he, he spoke so much about them. The first issue is innovation. Very frequently mentioned that innovation is the key. I, am, I have strong doubts about the importance of innovation. Uh, first of all, we know that the most innovative countries are the most advanced countries. United States, Germany, Japan, UK, France, maybe some of the East Asian countries, and full stop. All the other countries where the part of the level of GDP is less than half of these countries, or even less than, or even a third, they don't, cannot have innovation. It, it's, it's a naive idea that if a government spends not 2% of GDP on innovation, but four, that would really matter. No, uh, innovation is, is the game of the most advanced countries. Um, innovation is oh, in a way measurable at the large scale. This is what it's called the Nobel Prize. The big innovations are awarded with the Nobel Prize. And it's not by chance that all these Nobel Prizes are awarded to Germans and Brits and maybe uh, Americans, Germans, Brits, and, and almost full. And this is the full list. The next point, which is also important in the context of uh, uh, talking about um, Orban, that Orban is an innovative figure. He has introduced lots of innovation worldwide and within Hungary things about which most observers, including ourselves, told and wrote that this is impossible, he won't do that. He did that. So in fact, innovating, changing the laws, changing the institutions, changing the mentality, changing the public discourse, uh, it is possible, but it's very often wrong. And I think with Miklos, we would agree if somebody asks, what was the thing that Orban did well? And we would say, not very much. Most of the things which he innovated were wrong. And that can be broken down to tax policy, social policy, foreign policy, and so forth. So innovation in itself is not a guide to understand the, the Orban system or the present system in Hungary. Um, the second point, and I will speak a little bit more about this, is the question of values. Obviously, values of people are important, and we know that these are measurable. There are worldwide public opinion surveys, and we don't have any reason to, to have doubts that these surveys are realistically uh, mirror the distribution of the view of the people in a given country or in a given region. And uh, often such social studies produce maps and pointing out that uh, Eastern countries have similar values and so forth. Yes, I think this is true. But there are two important buts, caveats. First of all, one is that values are not randomly distributed. So it is not that pe some people are liberal, some people are conservative, some people like the death penalty, some pe other people uh, uh, are happy to uh, celebrate LMBTQ people. This is not a random distribution. It is very, very strongly correlated with certain social factors, measurable social factors, chiefly uh, 
level of education, uh, domicile, urbanization, village people are usually more conservative. Uh, village people have conservative views on, on sex and, and many other matters. So this is, this is a, a difficult thing also for uh, accepting by people representing the opposition because they have to say honestly that, well, what we get is in line with the expectation of lots of people. This is Orban openly saying. Uh, but Professor Wahabi, think about your own country, Iran. Do, you, do we think that the people in Iran were more modern, think way, modern um, oriented, thinking modern ways during the Shah? Obviously not. So what mattered was that there was a leader, the Shah, who tried to follow the logic of modernization and went against the people. He couldn't win this battle at the end, although in some other countries that could have been possible. So the issue is here that Orban deliberately chosen a political strategy, which is always counting the votes. Let even more practically, he's not only counting the votes every four years, which is done by others anyway, he's not counting the votes personally, but he is spending enormous amount of money on surveys. And public opinion surveys are also available, uh, partly by finance, by the government, but by partly other organizations. So he is following the mood of the people almost on a weekly basis, and he acts accordingly. So uh, Orban openly says that what I'm doing is in line with the expectation of people. And in most cases, he is sticking to this. There were very, very few counterexamples when Orban proposed something and he met opposition in the public opinion surveys or in the view of the people and then said, okay, sorry, sorry, let's step back. Uh, famously, just for the audience, easy to remember, there was an internet tax suggestion which the government wanted to introduce and young people rebelled and within two weeks the whole thing was taken off from the agenda. Uh, but it was taken off from the agenda after a relatively large uh, um, uh, public demonstration with uh, strong anti-government slogans. So Orban is basically uh, following the logic of, of uh, this kind of calculation. And, and that's, that's the problem. Politicians, if they... Uh, really believe in illiberal democracy, as, and Orban does believe in that. He really thinks that what matters is just the elections. And if he knows how to plan the composition of voters, just using the word of Nikos, he is planning. How many people will I have supporting me in uh, local elections? How many people will support me in the European elections? Uh, how can we or how should we as a government modify the, the law, the laws, the election laws, and so forth. So this is very, very carefully planned. This is, you can call it an innovation. This is all harmful. And what is behind it, uh, in my view, is not just the arithmetics that he's calculating the politics in that way, uh, but also he has certain deep convictions. Uh, Miko said and correctly said that uh, everything is decided by Orban. That's true. So there's no such thing as a government. There's no such thing as a political party. Fidesz is not a political party. Fidesz is just an, uh, an appendix to the working office, the home office of Orban. Uh, very often very rarely really consulted. So uh, what matters is what Orban thinks. And there is one more guy, a long time old friend of Orban, Mr. Kovir, who is 
has been for a long time uh, chairman of the parliament. These two guys mean what they say, say and what they do, in my assessment. I can be wrong, of course, but my assessment is that Orban and Kirby, these two guys, mean what they say, they mean the politics, what we observe. All the others are not just uninteresting, uninfluential, but most of them don't agree with this. But they are following this because that is their interest. And Orban has a personal policy, not a very innovative one, namely that who is not against him is going to be supported by the end of his life. So if you were one once in the political uh, elite and you got a position, be a rector of a university, be a deputy minister, or be a successful sportsman. And as long as you are faithful to Orban, even if you leave politics directly, they will take care of your future in terms of money. Okay. Uh, just to give you an example of uh, it's similar to what Miklos mentioned. Um, sportsman or artist, if you are liked as an, as an actor, by the government and by Mr. Orban, you will get an award. It's not a big thing, a national award. But this national award entitles you for elevated pension for the rest of your life. So uh, having a decoration, what you can put on your breast, has enormous financial value. And you will get this pension as long as you live. So in a way, Orban is buying the services of hundreds of thousands of people who are not thinking the way Orban does. Uh, so the illiberal ideology, the, the conflict with the European Union, the conflict with the United States, and all these things are deeply felt by Orban and Korea. They really hate Americans. They really hate uh, Western European politicians, and they really admire dictators on the logic of the liberal system, namely that if we have the view and the love and the appreciation of certain social groups, mostly the less educated people, people living in rural areas, and um, uh, people with some kind of family history which goes back to the times of the Second World War and even earlier, so people have certain historical uh, identifica identifications with the past, uh, then uh, these people are needed, these people are collected for, for supporting Orban. Uh, and, and, and that's it. And this will not change, this cannot be changed from the inside. This can change only from the outside. And the very same people who are now speaking pro-Orban, who are making fortunes from the support of Orban, will lose all, all this, and then they will change their opinion. And they will say that we never really supported Orban, we were just forced to that. So uh, the conclusion, because I think I mostly exhausted my time, the... Um, the conclusion of mine is not different from Miklos. This system has become too strong, too deeply rooted, and people are not likely to change their mind because then if they change their mind, they will not be able to look at the mirror. So why did I vote three times for Orban if I'm voting now against him? So uh, that kind of continuation is, is strong. And, and very unlikely to change. Hungary needs a major external shock, which can suddenly change the view of the people, uh, which happens, by the way, uh, quite often. Think about the Middle East, uh, all these various springs. Think about 1956 in Hungary. Uh, changes can come very, very fast. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Pete, because you exactly used 15 minutes to uh, give your report. Thank you very much. Now, we will give five minutes to um, Miklush to react to uh, critical uh, assessment of uh, Pete, and then the floor will be opened to the public. Thank you very much. I, I won't use the five minutes, I think, because I fully agree with, with Peter. Um, almost on, on everything, actually. He had many things to my uh, ideas. Uh, I would I would add that what, what Peter said, that they feel that they are Democrats, they are openly said that, that those who are not supporting them are not Democrats. And they are Democrats because they are supporting the majority. Like and Peter said that the rural not educated people. So those who are actually not supporting the majority will against the minority are not Democrats. The triumph of the majority, if you remember that. Uh, and and they use the sticks and carrots very cleverly. Uh, yes, I agree with that education is, 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 I think, one of the critical factor which we should analyze in, in political capitalist systems when we compare them the education systems, public education and higher education uh, later on. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's the definition of innovation, whether we call in innovation what Orban is doing. Of course, we can say that innovation can be something really bad uh, mm -hmm. for the society. And it's, if, if it's look at such a way, then of course it's, it's innovative. But uh, previously, so, so to be honest, I don't think Orban is a real innovator because if we look at the word, many other points in the word, we, we can grab something he used. Special, uh, I don't know, social policy is, is not an innovation. They used other countries as well. I don't know. Uh, uh, attacking NGOs, it's coming from Russia, Israel. Uh, Netanyahu used that first. So, so it's 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 a. Uh, I would say it's a learning organization, <laughs> what Orban is building up. Learn from all the others, scanning the the new knowledge, and and using to hold uh, power. I, I I really said that I didn't talk a lot about those points. Peter mentioned a bit foreign policy. Uh, uh, tax policy and social policy because they are really interesting points where Orban really do bad things for the society and and the people don't really understand the mass that it's bad for them to the mass. So Orban is doesn't want to to educate the people because because that that's the point that if you are not educated you will vote so it's not the aim and of course if you are rich you would like to become powerful so it's, it's we don't want the middle class to be big in hungary it's written by guriev as well these illiberal system not supporting well-being of the people uh, so these really bad innovative policy as as as, as peter said uh, and the last point, uh, two, two points I would like to mention. Uh, for, so I, I look liberals, but I hope it was clear. For me, conservative, social democrats, greens, all are liberals. Because those who are supporting liberal democracy and in Western European countries, conservative parties are accepting rule of law, uh, minority rights, and these are other things. They are, they are part of the group who are supporting liberal democracy. It's not about liberalism as a party or something like that. Uh, the only point, so, so the question is whether the change will come from outside, because as, as I understand, Peter said that we can change the system only from outside, an external shock. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Of course, it's, it's very helpful if we would have, but that, that, that will say that we cannot do anything. Uh, which which is very painful to say, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm doubting that that that's the situation. But I don't say that I know how to change the system. Thank you very much, Miklos, for your responses to critics. Now uh, the floor is open 
whoever wants to ask a question, to raise a question, to raise a question, or to um, formulate some comments, you are welcome. Yes, Philip has taken Thank time. Thank you for your presentation. Very informative and very interesting uh, presentation. I have two questions. My first question is on what values and the, the opposition between uh, Eastern and Western values. I uh, understand that uh, and the rule played by your religion, spiritual values, and family, national feeling in Hungary. My question is. Uh, According to you, this opposition between values uh, is a new kind of opposition between the elites and the people who hold the, the right values. Mm -hmm. That's my, my first question. The second question concerns the geographical limits uh, of this uh, Ill, uh, illiberal uh, capitalism. When uh, you live in France, in recent times, you can also see uh, the denial of democracy. And, uh, the, the reinforcement of the police power. Mm -hmm. So in France, there is no dominant uh, party, but uh, police repression uh, of protest. Uh, and there is so uh, strong political capitalism with connivance between uh, private interest and public servants. I read the article about that, yes. So my question is, uh, is uh, this illiberal capitalism uh, spreading to Western uh, democracies? Should I, I think we will take more questions so that you could have uh, more flexibility. Okay. Sahar? Yeah. Uh, informative, written, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I especially I think that your theoretical frameworks can uh, help us to explain the political and economic system in the especially Middle East societies. I, I talked about, I think about uh, uh, the Kurdish region of Iraq when I saw your theoretical framework, but uh, part of your presentation when I walk, I uh, have read your abstract uh, that the, 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 you know, the strict uh, distinction between uh, Western values and Western values for me was the kind of, you know, maybe an Orientalist approach to East and uh, to not recognize the pluralism within Western society as well as Western society. Absolutely. Okay. It was as well interesting when you, uh, I think it was in the last slide, not the last, but uh, in the slide you you you, you note, uh, for example, uh, searching enemy nationalism, something like these factors to show that how we can um, explain or name illiberal societies. So, uh, do you think that we don't have nationalism in Western societies? And should we consider all kinds of nationalism as a, you know, as a reactionary uh, or anti-democratic ideas, for example, the subaltern nationalism? What we, uh, how we can, uh, you know, explain the subaltern nationalism, which is a kind of resistance against the, uh, you know, uh, Western values or, uh, you know, nationalism from the bar or you know, state-centric nationalism, something like this. That, so uh, I was wondering if you, if you have an orientalist approach to Hungary or in your study? So Good question. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. We will be taking another, you know, question or remarks, and then after the third one, we will pass the floor to uh, Miklush to reply. Please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> Leila Ahmadi, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, such a nice uh, presentation. For me, it's really uh, interesting. But uh, 
concerning uh, the, I think it's, it was the last uh, slide. Uh, is it a stable system? I have a uh, question. Uh, you, you mentioned before that uh, you have a, such kind of uh, destructive coordination mm -hmm. in uh, Hungary. Uh, but uh, we can conclude uh, considering uh, this, uh, such a um, destructive coordination. Uh, there exists uh, uh, in Hungary economic system that is uh, stable or not. Uh, but uh, in the other side, uh, uh, I saw something uh, paradoxical. Because uh, you you told us uh, that it's the kind of uh, fragile fragile system uh, because uh, I think you mentioned uh, in the slide how it could collapse quickly. Uh, I don't know. It's uh, mentioned to uh, the party uh, politics or to the economic system. Can you explain? Uh, explain a little a bit about that. I don't know. It's a stable, uh, at the same time, it's fragile. Mm -hmm. And uh, considering the destructive coordination, maybe uh, it's a stable system that it uh, reproduces uh, the kind of, uh, I don't know, kind of uh, shows uh, the kind of things uh, destructive, uh, but at the same time, it works. And maybe it's uh, the main reason that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the economic crisis, uh, can we can say, uh, in Hungary, it, it, uh, it's impaired uh, the growth of uh, GDP and some economic uh, index. Thank you. I understand the question. Yes. Please, Mitrush. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, can, can I can I ask my question because the, it's a bit to, really if it's yeah. she would like then we if you would like to go please ask your question yeah. then we yeah, will because, give floor to like, yeah, thank away. you because it's a bit related to what uh, Leila's uh, uh, said. Um, right. Actually, you, in, in your summary, you, you said that uh, sectors dominated by Hungarian SMEs uh, or in these sectors, the effect of uh, destructive coordination is significantly greater than the uh, uh, creative uh, coordination. So can, we, can you give us a, a concrete example of how the destructive coordination is practiced or showed in the, some sectors in Hungary? Yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nojit. Who, who is? Soprak. Soprak. Soprak, yeah. yeah. Uh, is, is this something written uh, the chat, on the chat? Um, okay. Hello. Actually, I have a question in the same line um, as Kamrat uh, asked. Uh, my question is about the defining um, the term of illiberalism. Um, can we say also this definition of illiberalism gives a legitimacy to liberal democracies? Um, I don't know if it was clear, but it's like we are talking about all anti-democratic um, uh, evolutions in Europe and uh, defining those regimes like um, a regime of Turkey or Hungary or other countries uh, by uh, an opposition, um, like epistemologic uh, opposition uh, of liberal democracy uh, can um, allow the legitimacy of uh, liberal democracies. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Now we give the floor to Miklush to reply. There are enough questions for you, Miklush. Yes. Yeah. You, you are very kind to ask questions. That's the best part of the whole thing. Uh, so values. So th that values is families, family and religious values, these kind of values. If you remember what I wrote up in the value system, it was th these were not, not part of it. So uh, I don't know. Uh, conservative values, uh, 
from from philosophers of conservative ideas, uh, Oxford's, and and they they put these in the core. It's they are not against liberal democracy. So it's I I don't want to tear apart these. So in my mind, that's why I said conservatives, social democrats, they have different kind of values we are following. Even in a, in this room, I'm sure. But if we can agree that rule of law, separation of power, these kind of things are important to, to cooperate with each other politically, that's enough. So those values is, is which, which of course I, I fully agree with you, that's very important values, but to change the system, it's not a question whether how we uh, focusing on individualism, family affairs and these kind of things. We can maybe choose the government which supporting family taxation or individual taxation. It won't hurt our democracy, how we play the game together. But, but those values I'm talking about, it's actually changing the, the political rule of the game. Uh, and I, I call these values. Uh, so in, 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 in